Well, good morning, Soundside Church. Pastor Aaron coming to you today. Thank you so much for joining us here on Facebook or YouTube. Well, if you've got a Bible, I hope you can open it to Matthew chapter 25. And as you do that, let me just go ahead and ask a quick question. When was the last time you sat down and watched the show, America's Got Talent? Now, I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever seen an entire episode of this show, but on numerous occasions, my kids have come to me showing me something on their phone, showing me an episode, usually what they call the golden buzzer. Now, I'm not sure, again, if you're familiar with the show, but various contestants will get on stage and they'll demonstrate some sort of a talent. It might be uh, a magician. It might be a dance number. Oftentimes, it's a singer. And the judges that are there, they're celebrities, they're artists, they're producers. And uh, if one of those audiences Auditions or one of those performances just absolutely wows the judges. Uh, they go ahead and hit what's called the golden buzzer, and that contestant uh, gets passed through various rounds of competition into the finals. And honestly, I've seen some incredible feats on America's Got Talent. Uh, some of those magicians are just unbelievable in some of the things they can do. Some of the dance numbers, I mean, uh, are just incredible. And then, of course, the singing. Uh, there are some singers on there that you just wonder how in the world has this person never been discovered and of course they are being discovered on America's Got Talent. Well the reason I bring this up is I wonder if you have ever considered where this came from. No, I don't mean the show, which I think came from Britain's Got Talent and, and other producers, but I mean the word talent, and automatically I'm certain probably almost nobody has wondered where we got the word talent. Well, the truth is I'm going to tell you this morning, because the word talent in our English language, this, this word that signifies a special ability, actually comes from from Matthew chapter 25, which is the passage that we're going to read in just a second. This passage is a parable. Uh, it's a story Jesus told that has, uh, it, it's a story that we're supposed to derive specific application and meaning out of. And he describes a parable of talents. Perhaps you've heard it where a master was going away for a period of time and he gave talents to his servants. He gave five talents to one, two talents to another, one talent to another. And when he came back, he wondered what they had done with their talents. And of course, the first had the first two servants had doubled the number of talents and the third servant hadn't. We're going to actually look at this parable today. And I'm going to explain why we're talking about this, because this parable is part of Jesus's answer to when he is returning and his encouragement for those to be ready. As we looked at last week, uh, the disciples were asking Jesus when you're returning, and he's giving answers, but he's also telling them how to be ready. And so this message today is part two of our series, Ready or Not. And in this parable, Jesus is teaching us that being ready for his return greatly depends upon what you're doing while you're waiting. The truth is, though, what we're supposed to be doing in the meantime isn't just waiting. To be specific, while we're waiting, Jesus has work for us to do. But this parable can actually confuse us if we read it as it is. And this is why. Because the parable uses the word talent, the English language has developed our word talent from this parable. In the 1300s, uh, Wycliffe translated uh, into the English language and churches started teaching this parable and teaching that what the servants did with their talent should be applied to the way that we use our abilities. And because of that, the word talent in English started to mean ability. In the original, it didn't mean that. And in the original English, it didn't mean that. But that's what it means today. And if we read the parable with that understanding, we are going to misunderstand what Jesus meant. And here's what he meant. The word talent to Jesus and his disciples didn't mean special ability. In fact, it was a unit of weight like a kilogram. It was actually quite a bit more than a kilogram, but it's as if Jesus said he left this guy five kilograms. 
not five abilities. Um, and if the unit of weight was measuring a precious metal, then it became a unit of currency, which is how Jesus is using it here in this parable. So normally in a message, I will start by trying to give a, a, a story or an illustration or example to teach us how we should start thinking in order to understand the scriptures. Today, I've done it because I want us to stop thinking in this way. And so what I've done is I've gone ahead and I have retranslated the parable, not because I think the Bible has a mistake. It doesn't. But because I want you to hear it the way Jesus said it. Okay. Now I have taken the equivalent of a talent and we can argue about the number, but I think I'm relatively close when I believe that a talent is roughly equivalent to $500,000 in today's money. And even if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter because the point still remains. So listen to the parable that Jesus gives his disciples to show them how to be ready for his return. Matthew 25, verse 14. And it actually might help if you don't follow along, something else I, I usually discourage. But here's what it says. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, he gave two and a half million dollars. To another, one million dollars. To another one, he gave five hundred thousand dollars. To each, according to his ability. Then the master went away. He who had received the two and a half million dollars went at once and traded with them, and he made two and a half million dollars more. So also he who had the $1 million, he made $1 million more. But he who had received the $500,000 went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the $2.5 million came forward, bringing $2.5 million more, saying, Master, you gave me $2.5 million. Here, I have made $2.5 million more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the $1 million came forward saying, master, you delivered to me $1 million. Here, I have made $1 million more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the $500,000, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and I hid your $500,000 in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the $500,000 from him and give it to the one that has the $5 million. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Soundside, my burden as your pastor is to stand with you before Jesus someday and hear him say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. I want him to say that to me, but I want him to say that to you. The truth is, however, in order to hear well done, we must first do well. Now, I've got to stop at this point, and I have to remind us of the good news of Jesus Christ, because our salvation from our sin is not earned or deserved by whatever works we do here on earth. In fact, the Bible says that the best works we can ever do are at best like filthy rags 
They don't amount to anything, which is why Jesus came. His works did earn perfect righteousness. He fulfilled his father's will perfectly. And then he exchanged his life for ours, going to the cross to suffer the judgment that our sin deserves, rising again from the dead to offer eternal life as a free gift to those who repent of sin and receive him by faith as their Lord and as their Savior. That is our salvation. It is totally of grace undeserved favor from God from beginning to end. Nevertheless, the Bible tells me as a pastor, it is part of my job to stir Christians up to good works. And it is part of your job as Christians to stir one another up to good works. Good works mark the life of a Christian. And God says he will reward lives of faithful service. This parable tells us that he will also reject a life of unfaithful self-indulgence. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to make a few observations on this parable. In fact, I'm going to make four observations about this parable, and then we're going to conclude with some thoughts on how to be a faithful servant, how to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So let's look at this parable. Observation number one, none of the servants owned what they were entrusted with. Did you catch that? None of the servants owned what they were entrusted with. The master did not give his servants a business loan that they could then repay and keep the profit. The master entrusted the servants with what was his. They made a profit and it was still his. None of the servants owned what they were entrusted with. And that's just a reminder to us that this is all of grace. Can I say it to you this way? It's all God's. It's all God's. Even the increase, even the profit they made is God's. Can I say it to you like this, church? When it comes to the life that God wants you to live, when it comes to the work that Jesus wants you to be doing while you're waiting, he has already given you all you need. He's already given you all you need. Everything you have, everything you are is God's. It's grace. He's not asking you to conjure anything up out of thin air. He's given you what you need. It's all God's, but it's also all God's. It's all God's. That is, there's nothing that isn't his and isn't part of this parable. And that is everything in your life is God's. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that means towards the end of the message, but let's start by recognizing that when it comes to what we do while we're waiting for Christ's return, everything that's part of our life is God's, and he's given it to us to do with it what he wants us to do with it. He also gives us the energy to do that. But all of it, there's not a part of our life that is exempted from this. Now, I say this because many of the people to who I'm talking this morning have trouble with this principle. And what I mean is, when I talk to somebody who is rich, many rich people take personal credit for their wealth. You could say, Aaron, I'm not rich. Trust me, if you're watching this video, odds are you are rich. If you make average or above average the United States median household, not average, but above the United States median household income, you are rich. On a global scale, you are in the top 5% of wage earners, quite possibly the top 2% of wage earners. Well, I don't feel rich. That's because you live around people who make the same or more than you do. That's why you don't feel rich. But if you look at this planet and everybody living on it, we are rich. And typically, rich people feel personal credit for their wealth, which is why the Apostle Paul wrote over in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, he says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. If you're rich, it's because of God, okay? They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold on that which is truly life. 
Ah, did you see it there? Salvation isn't by works, but even rich people have some expectation for what they're going to do with the money God has allowed them to have. It's all God's, and it's all God's. None of the servants owned what was entrusted to them. And that's a perspective we're going to have to adopt if we're going to understand what it means to be a faithful servant. Observation number two. Observation number two. All of the servants were given individual assignments. Okay? All of the servants were given individual assignments. Say, how do you know that? Because the master started with... uh, $5 $5 million, I think, is what he started with. And he apportioned it to his servants according to their abilities, which, by the way, is a great reminder that these don't signify abilities because he already knew what their abilities were and he gave the things to them according to their abilities. They each had an individual expectation for what they would do. Now, here's the good news for you and me, Christian. We all are different. We have different capacities. We have different abilities. And God has equipped each of us with what he expects from us. We're each given different equipment, as you will, because God expects something different from each of us according to how he has equipped us us. And that's incredibly good news because it means that we will not be evaluated according to what someone else has accomplished. You will be evaluated on the basis of what God has given you and what God intends you to do. You will not be evaluated based upon what I am supposed to be doing or what somebody else is supposed to be doing. God has an individual assignment for each of us according to what he has given us. Observation number three. Observation number three. The first two servants received equal awards. What? I should say rewards. They received equal rewards. Wait a second. They received individual assignments. They were given different amounts of money to manage, and yet they received equal rewards. Yes, they did. Did you hear it? Both of those servants, the master went to them and said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, which tells you that even an incredible sum of money is considered small potatoes on the grand scheme of things. You've been faithful over a little. I will now make you faithful over much. Enter into the joy of your master. They both heard the exact same commendation. You know why? Because they both worked with what they had. They both worked with what they had. The master was not evaluating them according to some standard. You need to reach this. The master looked at his faithful servants. They both worked with what they had. They both produced what they had worked for. And the master said, well done, good and faithful servant. Doesn't matter if you're handing me $5 million or you're handing me $2 million. You are a faithful servant. And for that, I am rewarding you. Which reminds us that even their work Even the work they did, not just the profit they earned, but the work they did was by God's grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10 gives us a great perspective on this. In this verse, the Apostle Paul reflects on the work he did compared to the work that others had done. But this is what he says. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Huh. He says... And his grace toward me was not in vain. It produced something. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Did you catch that meaning? This is incredible. By the grace of God, I am what I am. All right. I am not taking credit for who I am. I worked harder than them, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God working in me, which is a reminder that they received equal rewards because each of them worked with what they had. It's not about taking credit. It's simply about faithfulness. The master didn't reward them based upon their profitability. Yeah, they both had a 100% return. That's, that's true. But he rewarded them because they were faithful. They worked with what they had and what they had was what he had given them. What they had was the grace of God. You do too. You do too. 
Don't worry that God is up there and he's got some number that you've got to reach. That's not how it works. The Lord is looking at us to see if we're faithful to work with what he's given us. Finally, observation number four. Observation number four. The third servant was useless. The third servant was useless. Can I say it this way? The master was actually better off without him. The master was better off without him. You know, we've experienced in recent days an insane amount of inflation. And whether you believe inflation is 3% or 7% or 10% doesn't really matter because if you take your money and put it in a savings account, you will not make the same amount of interest that you are losing through inflation. In fact, if you want to know how to lose your money, put it under your mattress or put it in a savings account. Why? Because your money will actually lose value as inflation increases. This servant did the same thing. Now, the master tells the servant that he could have put the money in the bank and he would have gotten more with interest. Now, not exactly the same thing for us too, but we're really not even talking about money, so does it really matter? The master's whole point was, hey, you knew that I know how to make money. On the one hand, I'm not so worried about the amount of money you make. I'm more worried about, are you going to do what I told you to do? The servant said, I was afraid, and so I buried your money. Here's your money. And what the master basically said was, I was better off not giving you anything, Because I could have put the money in the bank and I would have had interest when I returned. But you did absolutely nothing with it. By the way, same thing is true for us, right? If you stick your money in the bank, the interest is low, but you'll still make some interest, which you won't get by burying it in your backyard. And the master said, I'm better off without you. You are a useless servant. He called him wicked. He called him lazy. And then he called him here at the end, he says worthless, which literally is useless. And as a result, he is shut out of God's kingdom. Remember, these parables are all about people who think they're ready for the Lord's return and in fact are not. And there are many people who give the impression of being Christ's followers who at his return will be shown to be not his followers. And that's because an unfaithful servant is actually an unbelieving servant. And we are saved by faith. This parable is for those people who think that they are ready to meet Jesus, but they are not. If you're not useful, you're not ready. But if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you must believe that everything in your life is from him and for him and that he has work for you to do. So how can we be useful? How can I be useful? How can I be ready for the Lord's return? And the answer is invest. Invest. Oh, (laughs) again, I'm not talking about your physical money because if your investments are like mine today, almost all investments are absolutely tanking. All right. Now look at that stock market. It's going down. So I'm not really talking about investing our money. I'm talking about investing everything the Lord has given to us. But let's go ahead and ask, what is an investment? What is an investment? Is an investment something that loses value? No, it's not. I have to talk to my kids about this sometimes because they want to make a big purchase and they tell me, but dad, it's an investment. (laughs) And I have to point out to them, no, it's not an investment if it loses money. So can I, for instance, a car is not an investment. Your car begins losing money instantly. It loses money, loses value sitting still. Uh, A computer is not an investment. It loses value. Now, hold on just a second. That's not entirely true. While a car and a computer do lose intrinsic value, that is true, a car and a computer can still be used to generate a profit. Let's say you're starting a business and you need a vehicle. You can buy the car. Yeah, the car is going to lose value, but you can use the car to make more money. Same with a computer. A computer's going to lose value. It's going to be obsolete in a few years. You're going to replace it. But you can use that computer to make a lot more. And so when we talk about an investment, we're not necessarily talking about the value of the thing itself. We're talking about using money to purchase something that can be used to accomplish a greater value. That's an investment, something that can be used to accomplish something of greater value. And that's how we're supposed to be thinking of this parable and thinking of our lives. When I say invest, what can you do that will, what can you use that will create something of greater value? Now, I have gone out of my way in this message to avoid using the word 
talents, okay? Jesus used the example of money. Yeah, he did use the word talent, just not the way that you use it. He used money. But here's the thing. Jesus is not looking for a ledger when he returns. So let me go ahead and mention a few things that you and I might invest while we are waiting for him to return. The first thing we can invest is our time. Our time. Uh, We are, at the same time, the busiest and the most entertained generation in history. And why is that? Well, because of the way we choose to use our time. On the one hand, we choose to use our time in order to try to accumulate things that are either for our comfort or our status. Yeah, I know, some people are struggling to survive, but many people are not. And even those struggling to survive are still interested in status and entertainment. Older generations had this weird idea of, quote, improving the time. When people would get together, they would wonder, how can we improve the time and not just waste it in idle chatter? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16 tells us that we should be redeeming the time, or in the ESV, making the best use of time. Can I say it to you like this? If you ever visit a cemetery, uh, you will obviously see tombstones. And on many tombstones, you'll see the person's name, and then you're going to see a date that was the date of their birth, and you're going to see another date that was the date of their death. And in between those dates, you're going to see a dash, a dash. That dash represents their entire life. My question is, did your dash matter? Did your dash matter? add value? Did your dash make the world a better place? Did your dash result in more people worshiping God? Did your dash result in more people loving Jesus? Did your dash promote the kingdom of God? Did you take that dash that God gave you and create something of greater value with it? Not just our time, by the way, but related, something else we can invest is our health. We can invest our health. Yes, we can invest in our health so that we can maintain our health and be healthier. But let me just say this, tragedy does strike, okay? I'm totally acknowledging that. But in general, in general, please don't find the exceptions because there are some. In general, healthy people are able to serve God better. I didn't say they can glorify God better, all right? A person in a wheelchair or a hospital bed can glorify God uh, and often do glorify God in ways that people walking around don't. But in general, healthy people can do things more like sharing Christ and serving the poor. And, you know, you get the idea. Why are you healthy? Are you investing in your health? You say, oh, yes, I work out because I got to have my beach body. All right. There's a difference between vanity and usefulness. Usefulness. You see, I believe we should invest in our health so that we can invest our health in our usefulness. Right now, I'm assuming you are healthy. Maybe you're not. If you're not, let me know. I'll pray for you, okay? But you are healthy right now because God wants you to be healthy right now. And you and I should ask why. Why? Why am I upright walking around and not in a hospital bed? What does God intend for me to do with this health that maybe I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't have it? You know, today is Father's Day. It is Father's Day, which brings me to something else that we can invest. And I'm going to speak to a very specific group of people. I'm going to talk to the dads out there. I'm going to talk to the fathers out there. You have been made a father. Invest your fatherhood. Invest your fatherhood to create something of greater value. And the Bible is so simple on this one. Fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's really basic. But the truth is, how many of us fathers don't invest our fatherhood? You can say, well, Aaron, I might mess it up. Aaron, I'm not qualified. Aaron, I don't know how. Well, that's that unfaithful servant who took what the master gave him and just buried it. Hey, if you're a dad, God is going to expect you to give an account for how you raised your children. Me too. Let me say it like this. Making babies can be one of the easiest things in the world. But being a godly father can be one of the hardest. And yet God gives us all the resources necessary to be a godly father. And he's not necessarily looking at the outcome because your children are free moral agents on their own. He's looking for faithfulness. Now, I've talked to dads. Not all the guys out there are dads. So let me just talk to men in general. Since it is Father's Day, I can get away for, get away with this. Guys, did you know the Bible tells us what masculinity is? 
I know our culture has an idea of what masculinity is, but the Bible actually tells us this. Now, you do have to combine things because in the ancient times, nobody actually thought this was a question worth asking because everybody kind of knew it. But the truth is, most men are stronger, bigger, and faster than most women. Yep, you can find a strong, big, fast woman out there, one or two, that are stronger, bigger, and faster than one or two uh, kind of smaller, slower, weaker men. But in general, men are stronger, bigger, and faster than women because God made us this way. Say, why did God make men stronger, bigger, and faster? Because he intends for men to do something for women, and that is protect and provide. Now, this uh, this is mostly within the family structure, okay? And I don't want to get weird on this, like saying all women have to submit to all men. Hogwash, okay? But the role that God intends men to play is the role of protector and provider. And if you're a man, God made you a man. Wait, God made me a man? I didn't choose to be a man? No, you didn't choose to be a man. That is absolute nonsense, pseudoscience based upon ideology and dogma and absolutely nothing scientific about it. You didn't choose to be a man. You were made a man. And you should ask, why did God make me a man? Look, We don't define masculinity by our culture. Our culture has assumed some things, some things that may be good, some things that may be horribly awful, but God made you a man to protect and to provide. Let me ask you this. Does it matter that you're a man? Let me ask it another way. Is the world different and better off because you are a man? Your creator put you here to be a man, to protect and provide. And right now, our culture has a crying need for men to step up and do some protecting. How many times do I have to turn on my computer in the morning and read the news and read about another sexual abuse scandal? Those are men who are abusing their masculinity and God will hold them accountable for it. But the women in our lives need men to stand up and make sure that doesn't happen. In fact, we men need to be pursuing justice for women who have been abused. And I'm not going to say anything uh, too explicit because I know this is going out on YouTube and Facebook, but men, God has given us some means that are related to us being bigger and stronger and faster that could take care of some of the sexual abuse before it ever gets out of hand. And I think we need to be stepping up and fulfilling that role of protector and provider. Now, I did avoid using the word ability throughout this message, but I'm going to use it now because what God has entrusted us with are our abilities. Okay, talent here doesn't mean ability, but that is one way we can apply it. And because it was applied that way so many times over the centuries, that's why we think talent means that. But you got some abilities, right? Do you know what they are? What are the special abilities God has given to you? Have you developed those abilities? Why do you develop those abilities? So that you can be useful for the kingdom of God or so you can be useful to yourself? Look, if you have an ability, it is because God gave it to you. He intends for you to invest it, develop it, and then use it to create something of greater value for his kingdom. And he will hold us accountable for those abilities. Finally, I have said that talents doesn't mean abilities, Talents means money, so let's talk about money. None of the money you have is yours. None of the money I have is mine. Throughout history, Christians give 10% through their churches to the Lord to remind themselves that none of what they have is theirs, and it reminds them that it comes from God. We call this tithing. You could say, well, Aaron, I can't afford to tithe. Well, the truth is we can't afford to tithe and live at the same level as people making the same amount of money as us. That's just math, okay? But the truth is Jesus will expect us to give an account for the money he has allowed us to have. And if you didn't tithe, what did you use it on? That will be a question you'll need to answer to Jesus, okay? And it's important for us to recognize that We will not be able to live the same way as somebody who makes the same amount of as we do if we're giving 10% to the Lord's work. The truth is, it's not even really about tithing. The Bible, this passage here doesn't mention tithing. The Bible here actually mentions using our money to serve others. And we're going to see that this money is intended to be used to serve the poor. So my question to you is this, has anyone else's life improved because of the money that God let you have? Oh, I'm not talking about, I use all my money on my family. Well, good, you're supposed to serve your family. You're supposed to provide for your family. 
What about everybody else? What about the poor around you? What about the needy? Has anybody else's life improved because of the money Jesus let you and I have? The truth is, church, Jesus left us here for a reason. And when Jesus returns, he's going to ask, what did you do with the life I gave you while you waited? Are you ready or are you not? If we are to hear well done, we must first do well. I have tried to stress throughout this message that we are not saved by the works that we do. And even the works we do are done by God's grace with what he's given to us by his grace. All the glory goes to him. Nevertheless, if we are to hear well done, we must first do well. So let's begin by recognizing that we are what we are by his grace. And then let us pray that his grace will make us useful. Let's pray that. Lord, thank you so much for the grace you've given to us that has shaped us, that has formed us, that has filled our lives with good things. And now, Lord, we pray that that same grace will use what you've given to us, will use us and make us useful. Lord, I so desperately want to hear, well done. And I so desperately want my brothers and my sisters to stand before you and hear, well done. So Lord, may we be ready for your return by receiving your grace and living useful lives that we can then present to you for your glory at your return. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.